All right, welcome everyone to Making the Case for Recycling, session number two. Uh, I want to go through, uh, I'm Emrad, I'm from RRS. I'm helping to facilitate behind the scenes today. Um, so uh, if you do have any issues, please feel free to uh, contact me through the chat function. Um, otherwise, uh, you are muted currently as you came into the room today. Um, and we'd ask you to stay muted uh, while people are speaking. Um, so that way we can cut down on any sorts of uh, background noise and whatnot. And you can hear this great information that's coming through. Uh, if you feel like you want to rename yourself, there's the ability to do that. Just click on your uh, area. There should be a little three dots or whatnot um, that you can uh, rename yourself. Use the chat box to uh, submit questions. So as we're going through, if you have a question, use that chat box. Karen uh, O'Brien, you see her over there in the corner, I think. Um, she is going to uh, be watching that chat, uh, making sure uh, if there's any pertinent questions, she's gonna ask our speakers to clarify and, and get those answered for you. So feel free to use that. Um, and then, of course, this session is being recorded, as I'm sure the lovely Zoom lady uh, said to you a moment ago. Uh, so at this point, I would like to introduce our hostess with the mostess, uh, Karen <laughs> O'Brien. She's the executive director of the Michigan Recycling Coalition, and she's going to be our moderator for the entire session today. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we are going to jump right in and talk about the agenda today. Um, we're going to remind you in just a minute why we're here and doing this Making the Case for Recycling uh, toolkit and what we intend to see um, uh, in September. You'll learn from Chris Case, um, Chris King, about the directional spreadsheet tool. Um, we've talked about this before. This is the second session. So some of you have, may have seen um, a little bit of this. We're, we hope to give you a little bit more information about what this spreadsheet tool um, is capable of by using an example from the city of Lansing in Michigan. Uh, Marty Seaman will be talking about the accounting handbook. Um, and that will kind of flow right into models for collaboration and market development that actually get us down the road to providing more recycling services um, to you know residents throughout region five and then we'll talk about um, the, the september workshop which is what we're all working toward here and the help that we need from you to to get people to that workshop um, so go ahead to the next uh slide so just to remind you, the Michigan Recycling Coalition received a grant from EPA Region 5, and we're working closely with RRS, who developed an integrated solid waste management toolkit for Region 4. Um, this toolkit um, has a number of components to it that you'll learn about today, and there will be more that we add to that for our September workshop. But it's really designed to, um, this process is really de designed to engage stakeholders in all of the region five states um, in, to get your help in applying these tools um, in helping uh, local governments and your recycling professionals in your states to understand the value of using these tools to find their way to um, adding recycling services, adding um, composting and organics management services to their um, service provision options, to their integrated solid waste management system. In Michigan, um, there's a significant portion of small to mid-sized communities that really rely heavily on subscription-based services. But as Michigan really works to build both the supply of material and develop the markets for that material here in this state we find it imperative to help those small and especially mid-sized communities that really haven't been engaged in a meaningful way in providing recycling services whether organic or inorganic um, to their communities they haven't been involved in many ways and uh, local governments really play an important role um, in in assuring the, the provision of these services um, and maintaining those over time. 
So um, these tools are designed to really help communities understand how they fit into the systems that you know are are around them, the the local systems, the systems they're adjacent to, uh, the regional systems they are a part of, and um, the statewide goals that we're all working toward. Um, so there's you know two different tools basically, um, and the they're designed to fill gaps in knowledge and understanding around the financial implications of providing these services. And, you know, it doesn't mean that local governments are providing these services directly, but they're at least involved in contracting or franchising or being involved in service provision in some way. So the two sets of tools um, or the whole toolkit that we're developing is really about understanding your role, the financial implications of taking that role, um, the, the need to get buy-in from all of the stakeholders who have, a, uh, who have um, some in, um, influence over what happens um, and really get them to a place where they're comfortable and they understand why it's so important that there's a whole suite of services available, placemaking, um, really trying to reach our material management goals. So you'll learn more about all of that today. And, um, and in September, we are planning a full workshop, about a two and a half hour workshop, where um, we hope that you help bring your local governments, um, local, regional, state government folks, we've talked to a lot of state government folks already, to the table to learn about the whole package and then those um, attendees can receive these tools then to begin to apply them to their situation and make the case for recycling. It's as simple as that, right? Um, so I will introduce Chris King, who is the, a senior engineer at RRS, who will talk about the integrated solid waste management directional spreadsheet tool. We've talked about this a little bit before, but he's gonna provide a little bit more in-depth information. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, if we just wanna to go to the next slide, we can get right into it. Perfect. So uh, the tool, it's really a decision-making tool um, and it's its directional um, to support um, local governments um, in essentially selecting their kind of level of service or making, um, right-sizing their ambitions for recycling. Um, so like I say, it's very directional. So the, the inputs or excuse me, the outputs are going to show you um, kind of comparative across different levels of, of service and what those kind of implications are when you make those changes. Um, and that compares the kind of cross, excuse me, costs and impacts um, across, you know, several scenarios and several different kind of processing options. Uh, so if we wanna go to the next slide. So the, the model itself um, starts with 15 uh, easy to answer questions. Um, and the model's been pre-populated with data according to your region um, regarding um, capital costs, so like truck spins, um, some MRF costs, um, as well as labor costs, disposal costs, and kind of other fees associated with recycling and, and recycling processing. Um, and all of those feed from kind of this these 15 um, easy questions, um, and then that kind of modifies the, the back end of the model to be more customized to um, based on these 15 questions. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So uh, there's a, a portion of the model that's focused on recycling collection. Um, and that has seven different scenarios uh, related to that. And that starts with a, a comprehensive drop-off um, and goes through dual stream with bins, dual stream with carts, um, and then single stream uh, with carts as well. Um, and then those are also broken down uh, with weekly collection and every other week collection to see the impacts of those kind of decisions um, on the overall uh, program costs. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, there's also an organics collection portion of this um, and organics collection um, is really focused on kind of four different scenarios here. Um, it's looking at yard waste only uh, and then yard and food waste and then really two processing options which is aerated static pile um, and a windrow system. Um, that you can compare across. Thank you. 
Uh, and then the, the last part of it is a hub and spoke uh, analysis. Um, and this is really used for comparing um, direct haul and transfer. So direct haul being that the, the same trucks that are on the route um, drive uh, from the community to the processing center. Um, transfer being that it goes to a through a transfer station um, and, then, and then goes to the processing center. Um, and then kind of those are costs associated with building that transfer center. Um, and then also looking at does building a MRF um, or a regional MRF uh, start to make sense um, and how that those kind of costs uh, parse out in between those different options. Next slide, please. So the uh, there's a kind of thresholds and community sizes that that's into the model. Um, and so uh, we kind of start with small communities. This is less than 7,500 households. Um, a lot of these scenarios you'll see there's there's really one collection truck so there's not a lot of diversity in that when you look across the different scenarios um, because they end up having a lot of the same capital um, and operating costs so there's not not as much difference um, as you go to a larger community like what we call medium community so it's at 7500 to 50,000 households you're starting to get into multiple collection trucks multiple drop-offs um, and now when you look at the different scenarios you can start to see a lot more of those trends um, and you know potential savings when you're doing every other week collection. Um, and then we get into large communities which are beyond 50,000 households. And this is where you start to see um, MRFs start to become more feasible. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a single community. It can be also a regional um, area uh, that would, would exceed this. And it starts to look at, well, okay, does it make sense to, or to, to invest in a MRF um, to allow processing capability for the whole kind of regional area? Uh, next slide. So uh, I guess, yeah, let me throw up an example uh, and share my screen here. Screen two, share. Okay, so um, what we have here is a, a, a pre-populated model um, that we've used some information provided to us uh, from Lansing. Um, and, and what I'll say is I'm going to end up tweaking through some of this, um, so it's not going to be exactly uh, Lansing's data, um, but it's a, a kind of foundationally based on Lansing's data. And then I'm going to throw in some scenarios um, that aren't necessarily the current state, but are, um, you know, could have potentially been scenarios in the past or even in the future, um, and how this tool would kind of help derot, guide some of, those, um, some of those decisions going forward. Um, so I'm going to assume most of you have uh, had some experience or seen uh, the 15 questions and how that um, kind of breaks down. Um, like I said, these have been filled out um, with Lansing. And I'll just go right kind of to the initial results here. Um, and then we'll go back and I'll do some tweaks and we can see how, how those kind of play out. Um, so the first thing we have here is the, uh, the collection side of the model. Um, and so, like I said, there's two sides of the collection model. There's the uh, recycling side, which is, is over here on the left, and then there's the organic side, which is, is further to the right. Um, and one of the first things um, I like to look at is really these, these kind of anticipated tonnages and how those relate to um, these different uh, collection models. So as you can see, recycling drop-off um, provides kind of the lowest uh, diversion level here or, or level of, of material collected. Um, and then as we go all the way through um, to single stream weekly collection, you can see it's a significant difference um, in how much material is, is being collected. So community um, may have diversion goals and um, these would be able to help them say um, what level of service they would, they would likely need to meet some of those goals. Um, on the other side, another one to, it's good to look at is kind of the cost per recycled ton, right? So you may have ambitions, um, but we don't have the, the kind of the budgets or, or can't afford um, a certain service levels or would need grants and need to look at that um, in order to get to, to, to those levels. Um, again, some of the general trends that we can see right here. So recycling drop-off um, is, is on the, the lower end. And actually um, on this model, it's showing that the um, uh, single stream recycling with every other week collection um, kind of provides the most benefit, uh, excuse me, the, the lowest cost um, with really good benefit here. Um, it does have a much higher capital cost 
than let's say looking at recycling drop-off. So that's something to consider. Um, some of the other scenarios or some of the other uh, kind of things that, that jump out is the, the cost difference right between every other week collection and weekly collection. Um, and that comes at the kind of the, the lower level of um, kind of recycling uh, associated with that. So if you went with single stream uh, weekly collection, you would have a higher um, diversion, but it would, it would cost you more, right? Those extra tons cost more. Um, and then if you went every other week, you, you get still good high diversion, but you, um, but you end up saving a little bit of money too. So that's just kind of understanding your service level, what is, is possible. And really the reason that, um, as you guys can imagine, the reason that is, is because every other week you need less um, capital costs and less labor um, to, to essentially uh, do the same, uh, service the same number of households, um, but you do it on an every other week basis. Um, going into uh, yard waste and uh, or organics collection, um, kind of the big takeaway if we look at the, the tonnages is that the, um, the addition of food waste, as you would expect, increases our tonnages by, by uh, a significant amount. Um, and so, so increasing, adding food waste um, can, be, can be helpful. Um, again, if people want to deal with food waste and things, those are kind of pro programmatic um, decisions that you would make. Um, and the other kind of big takeaway, as you can see, is, is at least in this model, organics collection is, is significantly more expensive than recycling collection. Um, and that really comes down to just the expected lower yields um, with kind of similar level of, of capital and operating costs. Um, and, and so you end up with um, kind of costs that are, that are per ton that are, are higher for organics. Um, if we go to the Hubman Spark spoke results, so one of the things that we're going to see, um, just because this is the default, um, is essentially um, it's showing that there's very little cost uh, for directly hauling it. Um, and in this case, there's a facility very close to Lansing, so they're able to haul it directly there for minimal cost, so that makes sense. Um, the alternative of transferring doesn't really make sense for a facility that's close. So we don't really learn much here. So that's why I wanted to go um, and really maybe tweak some of these inputs just to show you how um, in a different scenario there you would make kind of how you would make those decisions. Um, so one of the big ones is how close you are from a direct haul. So let's say in this scenario, um, Lansing didn't have a facility nearby and they had to transfer, um, let's say 80 miles. Um, or they would look at, at what it would cost to, to build a transfer station. So we go back to the same scenario uh, or so to the same tab and we look at these two scenarios. So the one is here is initially direct haul. So that's, like I said before, that's recycling trucks coming off a route, um, driving 80 miles to the facility, dumping at the facility, um, and then finishing, come back and finishing for the day. Um, as you can see at that level, once you're getting, having to transfer um, this 80 miles, building a transfer station. So spending the money to have, the, have a facility built, you have loading um, of the material onto transfer trailers, transferring that material across. It actually starts to make sense um, at those levels uh, or uh, at those distances. And so this is one where if you're having, if, you, they, if Lansing had to go these 80 miles, the, the, the kind of starting to look at a transfer facility um, and, and thinking about that would, would become, uh, become an option. Um, the next thing we can also look at is, um, let's say that uh, we really were interested in more of a regional, the whole region as a, as a whole. So instead of just Lansing, we're looking at the region and there instead of 37,000 households, we have 65,000 households we think could be serviced um, by a, a regional facility. So now when I go to my um, to that same tab that Hub and Spoke, you can see now this, this single stream MRF has become a viable option um, and has been populated. So because we've now increased the, the number of households served by this region, um, we've gotten to a, a tonnage that actually starts to make sense to maybe look at processing. Um, and then you would have, um, this facility and you can compare across all three options. So the one, the first one is the direct haul to a facility that's 80 miles away. The second one is direct haul or transferring to a facility that's um, 80 miles away. And then the other one is building a, a single stream MRF that's local um, closer to, the, to those uh, 65,000 households. 
Um, and as you can see, they all become viable options and things to think about. Um, and you even really, um, you know, with, with processing and, and things like that, you're starting to, to make this, this case um, becomes uh, quite uh, reasonable. Um, one of the big takeaways, though, if we look at capital costs, is the big difference here is, is right, the, the building a facility itself is $15 million in capital. Um, so, you know, if the region's not capable of doing that or they're not in a position to do that, that's something to also consider are these kind of levels of, of how much capital outlay there needs to be um, to really make some of these um, ambitions uh, possible. Um, let me think if there was anything else that I wanted to highlight. Um, oh, so the other thing I was going to say, just just uh, go back to the, how the model works. This uh, this toggle, you would select your collection scenario here, and then this would model that. So for this, I was modeling single stream weekly collection. I can go down to single stream every other week collection, um, down to recycling drop off, and as you see, the tonnage is dropped, um, but some of the some of the capital costs still stay, stay the same. So you get um, increased cost per ton. Um, as your, your tonnages go down um, and, and things like that. So you would select a scenario from the results uh, from collection, um, and then you would input that into um, your uh, hub and spoke um, scenario. And the same thing goes uh, for, for yard waste. So I guess I can leave it there. If there's any immediate questions or, or anything else we wanna cover, um, I could do that. Chris, there is a question that came in um, on the chat here, and I think you kind of addressed this by putting in those regional numbers. <clears throat> but Tracy from the state of Michigan is asking how this toolkit could help counties. And so while you demonstrated that, the question that I would add on to that is how do you layer in or consider programs that already exist? Or how do you evaluate for a larger region or a county that has some programming and other areas have no programming within that area? Yeah, I think that that's a good question. I think from the county's pers perspective, you're exactly right. I think the, the what ends up being, instead of looking at an individual community here, we would really start looking at the county um, as a whole and all, all of the all of the associated kind of services um, that, that would be presented at, at that level or looking at that um, kind of number of households and population. Um, when layering in, it becomes a little bit more challenging um, to use this tool directly to, to look at that, that kind of layered in approach. But what it does show you is essentially uh, some of this upgraded if you want to upgrade in your service. So if you are currently at a, a recycling drop-off level um, and we're looking to go to let's say a single stream every other week collection, those kind of that upgrade and that comparison, um, I think can be can be done here, um, and you can really look at that and see if that um, if those kind of especially when you're when you're talking about upgrades and service level, if that kind of capital um, is is reasonable for your for your community. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. You can continue. So if we don't have any other questions, um, I can I can leave it here um, or. OK, great. I believe yeah. we have okay. some poll questions. If you want to stop sharing your screen, sure. Emred can share hers and we can we have a couple poll questions for the audience here. We need your feedback because ultimately we want um, we want to assure you're kind of uptaking these tools. So, you know, how useful do you think this directional spreadsheet tool will be for your local government clients? Um, you know, they might require some, you know, explanation in the state, um, but do you think that this is a local tool? We want to know. So you, um, if you hopefully you see this in the chat, but to respond to this poll, you will go to poll, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash recycle one, two, three on your phone or on your desktop. And you will see this question pop up and be able to put in your answer. Is there anything else I need to talk about with that, Melissa? No, you hit it spot on and, and you can um, open up another window in your browser if you're on your desktop or your laptop. Um, and like uh, Karen said, 
www.pollev.com forward slash recycle123. And we're going to have several poll questions throughout. So having that up on the side uh, in another window or on your phone, as, as Karen said, um, you'll be ready for the next polls as they come up as well. Right. We have two poll. We'll have um, another poll right after this one and um, three more at the end. So keep this up on your desktop or on your phone so we can continue. Um, we really want to understand how you plan on, you know, if you plan on using these and how we can improve or make them valuable to you. Okay. And Melissa, if you'll let me know how many have responded and when we can move on. Um, let's give it 20 more seconds and then we'll move to the next poll. Great. <clears throat> Okay, great. We got some good responses there. Um, yes, the next poll question, you know, do your local communities, your local government clients um, present um, other directional questions not addressed here? So basically, you know, you can just write in you know, what it might be missing from this tool or, or what kind of uh, challenges do you see in your communities using this? Why do you think this is not, you know, the most useful tool that's ever come up with? How can we improve? Layering of scenarios. Okay, that's interesting. Likely most local governments in Ohio likely are not aware of this tool. That is exactly why we're here talking about this today because we have uh, an event planned in September and we really, um, this part of this job here is to introduce it to you and get you invested so that you will share this with your community so that we can introduce them to it and help them uh, use it. Um, so we're glad you're here. And I believe maybe the layering of scenarios is, you know, this is a directional spreadsheet tool. It's not designed necessarily to tell you exactly what kind of program you need to develop and design. But with the information that you input into this tool, it, you know, provides you with some general guidance based on best practices and what we know about providing these services, about how your or this committee can community can fit into the larger recycling scenario. Um, design for, for specific for each state. Um, and maybe this is something, Chris, you can speak to because, yeah. um, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I was gonna say there are, there are some state level um, uh, uh, kind of inputs that go into there based on, on when you do select your state. So there is a, there is a, a, a toggle there for state. Um, I, I do think that some, some more specific things uh, uh, could be expanded on, um, but as of right now, a lot of the, the main things are kind of the costs associated with, with operating in your state around landfill um, and, and labor and things like that. So the, uh, so the, the state specific part is there, um, although uh, I, I can see where um, some of the more targeted um, things might, might be helpful too. Yeah, that's great. And, and Chris, maybe you can, you know, talk to this one, this question right at the top here, this statement, uh, counties and cities uh, may have very different programs. How does the tool work to harmonize the overall effort? And I think this is related to that kind of layering programs. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can just speak to that one a little bit. Yeah, so so currently, um, the, the, uh, the way the tool is designed is it assumes um, kind of one level of service for, for all residents. Um, and so it doesn't break out the individual um, uh, kind of sectors where there may be a higher level of service here and a, and a, and a different level there. Um, and so that was something we were 
considering maybe as a future upgrade, but currently it does not include um, anything to uh, kind of pair together, uh, let's say drop off and curbside um, in kind of a, a combined uh, unit. So, yeah, um, but yeah, but as a directional tool, you know, kind of understanding what the needs are um, on a regional basis, you can sure. kind of pull out information and see where the gaps may be um, yep. based on this as well. So that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. This was, uh, I think, really helpful. And I'll let you know as a group that um, all of your comments here, you know, we'll take back with us as we work toward, you know, the September uh, event um, as we continue to adapt the toolkit. So, so we're always doing more. Um, but now I get to introduce Marty Seaman, who um, lots of people know. He's the principal and executive uh, president, uh, vice president of RRS. And he's going to talk about kind of the funding and accounting handbook, as well as some other aspects as we go about actually trying to make things happen in Region 5. Thanks, Marty. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Karen and Chris and, and everybody for being here today. Um, I did want to address a little bit of uh, kind of the questions that are being asked. It's, it's great that we're asking about all these other elements of how do we solve all these problems um, you know, how do we implement best practices uh, everywhere? And so it's really useful to remember that these are all elements of a single tool. And the financial directional piece is really there to, you know, really right, as Chris said, right size your ambitions. Where do I fit in the system and how do I think about that? It's not to solve every problem. And it's really kind of neat because you can plug in the county's numbers or the village's numbers or a regional one and subtract out what already is being happened. You can see the change and what that would look like. So it gives you a sense of what things might look like, but it's not designed to solve everything. And likewise, this financial tool is not an active tool. It's not a plug and play. If I do this, I have my budget and I can go make the case for recycling. It really is designed again um, to help people really be able to be able to argue financially in all the places that they need to. But then there also is a third component in September, we'll be really revealing that, and that is how do you really get community acceptance for all of these practices, and how do you get sign off, and how do you get investment in all those pieces, how do you actually implement? And that's what I think is key to understanding about this whole tool. The charge from Region 4, and our view our charge here is to say, we have folks who are highly disposal dependent. We have many people who are outside of the recycling system. And we know we have these proven best practices that, that are should be a part of an integrated solid waste management system. What can we do to implement it? And so everything that we do has a very practical focus of how does it get me closer to deciding to creating a cooperative to get it done and then actually getting the investment to complete the deal. And in September, when we bring in all those other stakeholders, um, again, we'll have a chance to see that because unless you get alignment and investment in all these elements of what are proven to be you know, a part of every successful recycling program, you're not going to get the job done of, of really uh, improving recycling. So we talk about this a lot because that's really what is behind this is how do we implement these things? We don't work. How do we argue for that and go? So please, next slide. Let's go into the let's go into the um, the budgeting tool. Um, a lot of what the budgeting tool is about is again from a training point of view from the point of view of saying we need 300 people in region 5 who can go out and be champions for this and help their communities it may be individual community leaders it may be most of the people on the phone and it's going to be other folks who can do that but how do we uh, how do we get that done and one of the ways we get that done is by making sure that those folks are able to really understand internal issues um, all the internal issues that come up within any local unit of government or any authority or any implementing entity with a decision making you have to make. And this budget tool is designed to help people uh, understand those. Um, it also is really designed to highlight kind of fundraising and collaboration and kind of where that shows up and how you have to work to get that done. Um, but in, in all cases, it's really about emphasizing that you cannot make the case for recycling unless you can understand and make the case financially. That in all situations, if you're going to be an advocate, you have to be able to understand it from a financial point of view or bring that to bear. Um, for, for the two of the three years this project was going, it was called Make the Business Case. That was what was really behind it. And then we changed it to really just make the case for recycling because it applies to so much. But there is this, between this directional tool and this handbook, we really want to make sure 
that um, we have a really strong understanding. So in any situation, we can we can really make the case. Um, you know, here are some basic considerations that are highlighted in the in the measure, and we'll spend a significant amount of time in, in the training in September. Um, but again, it's really being um, kind of again as you look towards the bottom, you know, determining potential funding recognizing that education outreach needs to be ongoing. So most of this is about actually making sure that your programs that are done are done at the same level that everything else would be done. Um, if we were running a wastewater treatment plan or if we were running a roads program and we didn't have multi-year planning, we didn't have expectations, we didn't have a clear capital plan, all those pieces, um, you know, you couldn't expect to get anything done. On the other hand, shame on many governments if they don't have that done. They have a charge to implement integrated solid waste management. The slide above showed that we have proven um, uh, best practices that are there to be implemented and that work. And so a lot of this is about making sure that we're holding everybody accountable to what we know is done. These questions about is there markets, there's ample markets in the Midwest. These questions about can this get done as their contract mechanism? Yes, there is because there's just too many examples of very successful programs. So the is it feasible question, we don't really take it from the point of view that it's not feasible because it's been proven so many times in so many settings. And so it's really about how do you deploy those techniques that make those programs successful. And this is what this ultimately what all this training is about is making sure we're able to bring all those to bear to make recycling better. So go ahead, next slide, please. Um, you know, the book itself is, I don't know, 80 pages, something along those lines. It does identify a number of kind of spreadsheets, planning tool for budget prep. It really does help folks along um, in, in identifying certain pieces. Um, but again, where we like to really, in the training, where we like to go into is also show, hey, this is the line item where um, you contribute to an authority or you buy services, but you also contractually manage it. This is the line item where you share revenue. This is the line item where funding from the community foundation comes in. This is where uh, private investment into your infrastructure to allow more services happens or partnerships with the university or other key community members. So yes, you have to be able to prepare for all these things internally, including things like you know, the, the high cost of disposal when you put in legacy uh, personnel costs and other things. So some of it is how do I battle internally and understand this and, and helping local units of government get this done is very important because that's what they have to go through to get TS to implement recycling programs. So again, this is the kind of items that we're trying to help people with. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, so, you know, full cost accounting is something that we talk about a lot. Um, we focus a lot on um, collaboration. And so whether that's, you know, collaboration, like everybody in the town agrees that the township can buy services together, or it's many, you know, many communities, many regions come together to make sure that, uh, you know, serious uh, mill and other capacities brought to bear. There's a whole range of things that go there. But at the end of the day, understanding what everything costs and who should share in those costs who shares in those benefits becomes very important. And so, um, you know, this is all kind of glaze over financial stuff, but we, we really need to think about it. And in our training, we really emphasize that this is where you can say, are my capital outlays staying consistent with what we're doing across the rest of the, you know, the city, the township, whatever. And also where are those investments going? Are they going into things that are productive and sustainable? environmentally and economically or are they going into things that are last century and you know we don't want to be investing in disposal we want to be investing in recovery into programs that we know work and are cost effective so there's a lot of places within there to do quite creative things and to understand that if if a brand or a local foundation will will help with bins or will help with you know any item that helps you in your overall cost of lowering that cost increasing community buy-in increasing performance and so we really have to have people be able to advocate for that i saw uh jesse there was a you know people sign a contract and they go away yeah we understand that that's what this is all about you 
and you and you'll get what you you know you'll get what you bid for. Um, but if you are engaged and we can get a, a, enough folks engaged in managing those agreements and those huge spends that go into solid waste services, we can really improve the performance of where those dollars get us. Um, go ahead, next next one. Um, so again, these full cost accounting, these are things that we don't try to do um, in, you know, within the spread, within the budget book itself, except to help people understand that and to go through this. Um, and again, you know, including things like, okay, well, what is our retirement rate? What is our capital funding? What is our service cost that we should end up charging different programs? So it is quite comprehensive in allowing you to do that, but it, it uh, again, it's not plug and play. And it also it assumes that you're going to be able to, in a sophisticated way, bring other financial information, other things to bear. So some communities have that, some don't, some states take on that role of being that. And so finding a way to make sure that kind of Tech, uh, technical competence is around is also very important. And again, just like sometimes you can't afford a truck, sometimes you you know you can't individually afford a really good attorney or a really good marketing agent or whatever those things are. But together you can, and you can all improve your program. So again, these are these are you know, techniques that are identified. We think are key techniques, um, but also um, you know it's it's about going beyond that and understanding that really the community. Investment. It's, we don't assume that any program is going to be funded 100% by taxes. We assume that all programs are going to have a lot of revenue, a lot of inputs, and they're also going to have costs that go in a variety of ways. So, um, again, this just an ability to really talk about that and to be uh, eloquent when you need to in the finance committee, in the capital allocation committee, so that you can get to yes is the, the purpose behind this training. Go ahead, next slide. So yeah, here I we are again. Yeah, yeah, I, was say, yep. I think I'll leave it there. I'm going to pick up on some of the collaborative stuff after that, but, um, you know, it's enough to that. I, the one thing I did want to mention, Karen, and you might want to talk about that is um, we, in transferring this from Region 4 to Region 5, we added the compost model. We added a couple of things to adopt that directional tool to hopefully give it more value. Um, at the same time, we did not really make a change to the budget tool because of kind of what I was saying before. It's not active. It's really about training and having people understand how to how to do that. And it's embedded in a lot of the training coming up in September. Um, but we did receive some serious uh, additional funding from Region 5. We're really pleased about that. And so it does create an opportunity to um, maybe do more with this. And so if you're thinking about that, what kinds of things that might be state specific or might be of interest. We're, we're going we're gonna to beef that up a little bit. Hopefully some of the questions will get to that too, but I did want to give a shout out to the Region 5 and say thanks for that because we could use it. Yes. So. Right, for sure. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate all of yeah. that. Um, it looks like we've already got um, some participation in our poll everywhere, pollev.com slash recycle123. So get back on that and let us know how you think this particular portion of the toolkit um, uh, you know, how useful you do you think this will be? Um, and, you know, going back to Jesse's kind of original question, you know, do you find that, you know, cities and towns are willing to fill this out and um, freely? And I guess my response to that would be, this is a toolkit for local communities to use for finding their way themselves and nobody else is looking um, over their shoulder for this information and so the accounting handbook i think is a really important part of understanding all of the inputs um, to the directional toolkit and the other things you need to be thinking about because no one's looking over your shoulder and providing um, kind of input into that. So um, it's really important that it's the whole toolkit is taken um, together so that you're using it accurately and you're getting a result that really is meaningful uh, for your program. So, um, you know, so far we're, we're kind of about same place, useful. Um, 
that is great to see. Um, we want to make it even more useful to you. And um, I do think part of that is really getting the word out about this and helping people to, to kind of understand and engage with um, the data and information. So another question for you, what unique and creative, unique or creative, uh, local, regional, or state mechanisms or programs are used or needed to finance recycling. You know, in Michigan, we have a number of mechanisms that can be used, public, public acts, you know, taxes, fees. Um, um, but one of the challenges that we have in Michigan is many of our local governments, um, um, you know, think that maybe they can fund operation of programs through state grants and, and that really can't happen. State grants are about infrastructure and not funding the operation of programs, but they can fund those operations by using mechanisms. And so we are just wanting to kind of get responses from you about what those mechanisms are in your state, what is being used kind of creatively in your state. As, um, as what Jesse says, people are struggling with um, keeping, keeping their programs or enhancing programs. <clears throat> so these, uh, these kind of open-ended questions take a little more time to bubble up. So we'll, we'll give it some time here, but any responses are appreciated. Here, and just to get people started, I know some of the ones that come to my mind the quickest are things like resource conservation development districts heading up or our um, ag department grants being used to finance recovery, ag recycling, and other kinds of programs. Um, so kind of things that are maybe outside of the normal, hey, I've got a solid waste authority, but they use a, a drain commission or they use some other mechanism that allows things to happen. And um, you know, again, depending on how they use those, sometimes they're different rural versus more concentrated areas. So if we can share those best practices, it'd be great to hear from folks. In Ohio, the solid waste management districts have the ability to access ah, fees on solid waste the fees are collected at landfills and transfer facilities so <clears throat> that seems like a pretty stable fee or uh, mechanism <clears throat> not unique but common yes so uh, I think we find in Michigan too that a lot of the same tools are used over and over again. Um, but as we really try to engage uh, new um, communities, um, we may have to get creative because uh, there's a lot uh, that it's a, it's a heavy lift for some of these communities. Um, new grants from the Fed. Again, I feel like grants funding are really about kind of infrastructure development, capital investment, which is a subsidy on your program and lowers operational costs, but it doesn't cover all operational costs. Anything specifically from Indiana? Okay, good. Well, so Marty now is gonna talk about kind of models of collaboration and you know funding and financing kind of mechanisms. So Marty's gonna take it back up and try to bring it home by seeing like, okay, how does this, how do we make this happen? Thanks, Karen. And thank everybody for your uh, participation uh, in, that, in that last section. Um, I just want to go back to these, uh, you know, kind of what have proven over time to be really key factors and successful programs and also to the extent that folks implement these elements, they, they have sustainable, um, affordable community embraced programming. And so um, why it's important is because a lot of what you'll see in September and a lot of what is baked into really everything we do is that um, we understand that you don't get anywhere with just 
one of these or one of these stakeholders that there is the waste collection, whether it's your own internal folks or the people that you contract and how important that contract management is. We're hearing a lot about that and people kind of set it, forget it, as opposed to actively managing those agreements. And even though they're for millions of dollars, it's it's uh, unbelievable that how common that is, that, that there really isn't that kind of uh, you know, oversight on some of those agreements. And yet, um, having really best practices around that and, and active management of that is what successful programs have and do. And finding a way to make that happen is, is, is important. Um, you know, like obviously we talked about the processing infrastructure and again, the directional tool gets at some of that in terms of my hub or my spoke. Um, you know, what is that? Um, we're, we're really blessed actually in region four and in region five that while everybody wants better markets that pay more, um, we have a number of markets that have all of our key items that say, I'll buy everything that you could possibly produce. And it's about collecting enough and making sure it's uh, clean enough, but it's the, the outputs are there are very different than some regions. Um, you know, I talked earlier about the education and engagement, but frequently this gets short shrift. Um, it's something that maybe, again, governments don't like to pay for, but maybe other folks do. So, um, but I think we understand better than ever that um, you know, education engagement is, is key. Um, we're talking about uh, not servicing the bulk of the population that's in multifamily, where the bulk of new population is going, and where the bulk of underserved population is is in multifamily. And so, both breaking up or understanding collection and processing a little bit differently because of that, and the education engagement component of that is really significant. Um, you know, the supporting policies, we don't really go, oh, CPR or, or, you know, or bust or anything along those lines. It's just a recognition that the more you have a sustainable business plan around how you're going to cover your waste, there's going to be supporting policies that say, here's how we fund carts and make sure that they're in place. Here's how we prioritize collection. Here's how we do put or put, put, uh, page you throw or other mechanisms. But um, the point is, a well-crafted program has those policies as a way to reinforce what is the standards, just like people have stop signs and other kinds of normal uh, guardrails and all of public policy and public life. Um, and then the final one is public and private funding. And this is one that is really key because it can, can, can get at a number of, of your cost items, but also um, it is the place where service, you know, there's frequently been public sector investment into private services, commercial services, multifamily, et cetera. And so getting this funding right and the opportunity presented by EPR and other kinds of voluntary programming, is really significant. Um, Karen, I think in the Michigan program, it's, uh, it's about a 20% down, essentially, that the state or some folks would put in and we're looking at close to 80 from other entities altogether that that grant funding can leverage that much other investment altogether. So um, these are just really important pieces. And when we bring folks together in September, what we do is we bring representatives from each of those areas to talk about what's relevant for them to make the case. How do I get invested into your program? What are what conditions do I need? Because the other day you have to bring your entire team along if you actually want programs to, to work. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Um, and again, I hinted at this earlier, but I think um, what we find and what we see is the challenge in really bringing you know, sustainable materials management to bear, let alone circular economy, but at least from the federal point of view, sustainable materials management as a minimum. Um, some of these types of collaboration, collaboration are really essential. These are best practices that work. And when you start to run those numbers, it's not to say, oh, you can't do it. It's to say, I can only run a curbside program if I do collaborate or I do contract because it doesn't make sense, but it also makes other things start to become possible, like cooperatives to market material or to do other things to leverage you know, the, the highest value. I think what's really important besides these kind of community-wide contracting authority, some of these common ones, is the recognition that whether it's in an uh, agricultural setting with resource development councils or more urban areas and statewide economic development agencies, more and more become a source of funds, but also become a source of sort of community buy-in um, as as everyone deals with the fact that businesses need to be accountable and want to be uh, productive around recycling performance. So uh, key areas that again, um, 
you know, some of that, you know, there's questions, you know, is this check the box? Is this my, you know, my toolkit in a box? To some extent it is, and the training itself tries to pull some of those things together. But I think the real power of these is to say, okay, we've created this kind of uh, web to hang things on. At what level can each state or county take that deeper? What is your authorizing legislation around this authority? What is your authorizing legislation around uh, re regional collaboration? Like how can we make sure that you invite all of these people to come and be kind of, again, part of that warrior class that can really advocate for recycling? Um, but these are the kinds of folks that we really um, want to target. Um, I think there's another slide. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about some of these basic ones. We wanted to talk a little bit about one that is really doing this already. We've, we've, some of you may know, we've been involved in Colorado in a little bit different way, more of a kind of a market development, really heavy, um, you know, trying to solve for problems specific to this region. In Next Cycle, Michigan, it really is about advancing recycling in uh, many different ways. There's very much a focus on infrastructure development and helping people sort through that. What is my direction? And who does that mean I need to collaborate with? Or how do I need to change policies to include multifamily so I can have enough of a critical mass to offer services? Or I can offer services to businesses that are big generators of waste in my county, et cetera. Um, and so, the you know this is a, a much more elaborate program in the sense the state has put a, a lot of effort into it. A huge component that is data and data driven. Um, uh, you know, kind of a, a separate sister program that is very much intensive and that is including very intensive get out the campaign and get with people and get their numbers and get them the best possible way. And so you know you're right. Uh, you know how do you get those things to fill out well? things that are important for folks get done and they put resources behind it. And so it is that balancing of saying, well, this is something that needs to get done along with other items and it's about prioritizing. Um, but from, again, from the next cycle point of view, it, it does also bring in, you know, a couple of key elements, the businesses and the economic development entities in both participating in the financing and the community adoption of these programs, but also in bringing in business interest in recycling and then again more volume that changes the dynamics of not just uh, a processing plant but also mills or other kind of end processors who can contribute to michigan's economy on the recycling side and so that bringing that focus to bear is is really key and again that's part of the charge that we have and want for this region is how can we through the states or through the region really maximize the, the economic development potential of recycling and waste reduction. And, and again, this through tracks and some other mechanisms finds ways to do that. Um, but it's in some ways it's collaboration on top of collaboration. Lori was uh, a part of a, you know, a larger group that put together uh, their MRF in Lansing and a couple of different associations invested into that. And the state of Michigan invested into that. And a number of things happened to create somewhat of a model facility right in the middle of Michigan, and not a huge population area. Um, but it's because that model of collaboration helped facilitate a number of these different elements to all bring them about a better program. So, you know, it's not that that's easy, but it's also, it is quite doable. And there are, I don't say, a number of known methods to get these things done. And I think I'll leave it at that. Karen, I don't know, you've been quite involved with this. I don't know if you wanna add anything more on that side of it, but I think I think I'm happy to leave it at that and say in September we're going to bring enough people together and hopefully have people understand. Here's how you got to get together to really make things work. Yeah, yeah. Next cycle is really about infrastructure development and helping to build that. Um, but what we're really hoping to address with these tools is how they um, start to think about operational costs, what they are, how they get those covered and what kind of collaboration and next cycle is a tool to bring that coll collaboration to the table. So thank you, Marty, that's great. So really what we're trying to do with both session one and session two here is familiarize you with what these tools are in preparation um, for the September workshop where we 
um, attract a whole bunch of people, hundreds of people, we hope, to learn about these tools and use them for themselves to, to find their way, to see how they fit into a larger system. Um, but we really need your help for this. I personally don't have um, contacts throughout the region you know, um, you know who in your state is is could find this tool very useful. Um, we think that it's really for any local government client, uh, maybe especially those that really haven't thought about recycling before and are really curious about um, how it's working. You know, this may be a first taste of that. Um, state agencies and SROs are, are often, um, you know, local governments are the clients of these agencies and SROs and want to make that connection. And so one of the things we're talking about in Michigan is, you know, training some people um, in the use of these tools to go into communities and do some handholding around helping them find their way. Um, we encourage you guys to think about the same thing. Um, um, and so um, we want to learn from you how we can help you promote this in your state. We would like to provide um, kind of promotional tools. And so what do you need from us to be able to promote this? We're actually hoping to do this a um, couple months out from the event so that people have plenty of time to get this on their calendar. Um, go again to poll everywhere, pollev.com slash recycle123 and let us know kind of what specific um, tools or uh, things we can provide for, for you to support us through whatever social media channels, email outreach, newsletters, um, so that we can pull in a bunch of people to learn about this and, and apply it. Hey, hey, Karen, can I add one, just one other client Please. group that we, that especially we, we need your help with in to visit the state is you all know that there's 10 or 12 leaders in your state and they may or may not be a county person. They may or may not be a city person. They might be an economic development or a regional planner, but you all know who they are. And there are people who have authority, who have an understanding of this, who have the capability of getting things done. Those are the people that we want to have these tools and when we have a list of speakers to be one of those speakers. We don't want, you know, the environmental chair from the Association of Counties, that's nice. It happens to be one of your Minnesota commissioners, that's great. But it was really powerful when it's your community talking to your community and saying, here's how you get a yes from me at the county board. You need to do this, this, and this. Oh, thank you. And, and they're gonna come back to using these tools and figuring out how to do it. So we really, like I said, one of the goals is to have, you know, this isn't 101 training, the introduction maybe is, but this is 301, this is 401 training. We want people to really understand and really be advocates. So please, if you have those people, those are the ones who we really want to embrace this and to, to adopt it, because that's where the goal part is coming from. Uh, that's a great suggestion. A, a couple of outreach options, marketing the workshop and something we can provide. And an FAQ page, I think is a really great idea. Let's begin to help people understand what this is uh, in a simple overview and date to get people engaged and prepared. Yep, that's great. Um, you know, please respond to, are there, um, what way do you all communicate with your clients or constituents? Um, is it primarily email, direct email? Is it primarily newsletters? Is it primarily social media? Um, what is kind of most useful to you um, as you think about how you would push information about, about September, frankly, out? <clears throat>
how has um, you know registration and newsletter article? That's great, very helpful. Um, how um, the communication that we've been doing for these two sessions? How is it working for you? You know, um, have we hit on the kind of the right tone? Um, is it has it been enough for you to get here? Obviously, but do you think that that's something that we could provide to you that you could pass on? Yeah, yeah. So I'm seeing emails, I'm seeing newsletter, I'm not seeing a lot of social media. So get that. You know, if you'd like to unmute and we can simply talk at this time, um, we'd love to just simply hear from you, have a conversation. Um, I think we have addressed, you know, most of the questions or all of the questions in the chat. Um, but, you know, we could we could unmute and chat as well. Yeah, agencies don't have a lot of power. power. Followers. However, state recycling organizations do. They often foster this. Um, and um, state recycling organizations are about building networks. So, um, you know, please be in touch with your state recycling organization, ED, or staff to see how they can help promote as well. Yes, agreed. Um, social media for more local programs. Yeah, and you can kind of flip flop this question too, which would be how can you support our promotion of this as well? Like the hey, give us the stuff and we'll send it to our contact, that kind of so kind of either way, whatever whatever you think is gonna work, we're happy to take the load ourselves or to run it all through you or you know another potential is we do want to have a single large event, but if it turns out that you have regional meetings or you have other things going on, if nothing that says you would replicate this or couldn't replicate it, or um, you know, we region four, we did stuff like, hey, let's do viewing parties, you know, where the county uh, host convenes people all together and watches it on video and, or that kind of thing. So, um, you know, you know, we've kind of got the obligation to do this, to do it in September and to have this one big event, but really be thinking about it too, how it might fit better with things that you normally do, the old SWATA meetings in Ohio or you know, the annual conference or, you know, whatever that might be, um, because that's, that's, this is, that's, that's the way it fits. Yep. I, I also like the uh, suggestion of, um, um, you know, a no cost evaluation tool just to help people really kind of dial in and see what that's about. Um, on the chat, Jesse talks about um, solid waste management districts not being included or the association not being included. And that's exactly what we're looking for your help to do. Um, you know, if you have those contacts, you know, either make those available to us somehow or, you know, we'll make those the tools available to you and you can pass them on and say, hey, we really recommend you promoting this, getting people involved in this. We think it's a valuable tool um, that really you can use to, to develop your programs or to think about planning and developing enhancing programs. And yep, we're planning on giving you plenty of advance notice this time. <laughs> I think that means it's already too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody's thinking about September yet or, or maybe we are, who knows? Well, that's great. And I think we're at the end here. We actually plan to let you go a little bit early. We wanted to make it concise and to the point here, really just get your buy-in um, to help us promote this program, um, to, to help us commit to us in getting information about the September workshop out there and begin to think about how in your state you can promote and use it to help your local government clients really get in touch with what they could be doing um, to step up to provide new recycling services or enhance those services. We know that, you know, the economy is, uh, is, is, is a little bit difficult right now, um, but recycling is also an economic community, economic development uh, opportunity. And that's what we want to demonstrate with, with all of these tools as well. Uh, Marty, any last words for the crowd? I would just uh, invite folks, as usual, the, the directional spreadsheet's a lot of fun, and there's some new elements to it, and if you or somebody you know gets, wants to get real rabbit hole about it, 
Chris or Holly will be happy to take you there <laughs> and to explore what that might mean and look at some of those overlays because I think there's some there's more capability maybe than people understand in some of those regional overlays just by plugging the right numbers in. I don't want to yeah. it this way. So if there are questions like that, I guess really with any part of that, feel free to follow up directly with Chris or myself or anyone on our team. So um, you know we're you know we're more than available to to. To help and to make comments, have we made the the region four accounting handbook? Is that available for folks right now for them to see? Or that's something we could send out. Even I was going to ask stale, yeah. but I don't think we could. Again, everyone's understanding that we're going to be able to update that and, and yeah, that. I but, I have a sense that there may be some people on this call that weren't on the previous call, and so perhaps we should make the uh, directional tool in the accounting handbook available to anybody who was on the call today. Um, and so play around with that and, you know, let us know if yeah. you have any um, uh, feedback or have any questions about that. We should okay. be explicit too. The September event is free. There's not, that's yeah. so people know that, right? I, I just, I know that came up and, uh, you know, unless people think we should charge, but I, actually, no. I don't think EPA will allow us to, nope. um, but that wasn't the expectation. And so. it will be um, a webinar. So really easy for people to access. Um, uh, and I think that's all we have for you today. So thank you for coming. Very much appreciate that. And we will endeavor to get back to you with details about September, at least those, so you can put something on your calendar in the next two weeks uh, or so. Um, thanks for being with us today and we'll see you soon. Stay cool. Bye.